Imagine that you're walking past a pond in a park. Let's say that you, you know this park well. You've walked past it many times before. But today, as you walk past, you see that there's a small child who's fallen into it. If you don't save the child, it's very likely that the child will drown. But then the thought occurs to you that just this morning you put on your favorite pair of shoes. They're quite expensive shoes that you bought just recently for a lot of money. So you ask yourself, do I really have a responsibility to save this child? I don't know the child. Couldn't I just walk on and then not have to buy myself a new pair of shoes? Peter Singer is suggesting the unthinkable. No one would allow a child to drown in order to save a pair of shoes. Surely we all know exactly what we would do in that situation. I'm sure that you would save the child. And I'm sure that you would think that somebody who didn't save the child because they didn't want to ruin their shoes had something really seriously wrong with them. Someone who was just doing the wrong thing, not a good person. But now, I want you to think about a real situation that we're all in. All of us, that is, who are living quite comfortable, middle-class lives in a nation like Australia. There are, elsewhere in the world, children who are dying from preventable poverty-related causes. Can we really believe that we are living a good life, an ethically decent life, if we don't do anything serious to help reduce poverty around the world? and help save the lives of children or adults who are likely to die if we don't increase the amount of aid we're giving. Are we morally any different from the person who walks past the pond because they don't want to ruin their shoes? This is the kind of question Peter Singer's been asking for over 30 years. He's probably best known for his association with the animal liberation movement when he took to the streets to protest his cause. Grain that we feed to animals that end up on our tables as turkeys and hams could have gone to feed the third world people. At 62, Peter's published his argument about our moral responsibility to the poor in a recent book, The Life You Can Save. It's based on one of his earliest published essays called Famine, Affluence and Morality, written when he was just 25. Peter Singer, you've been putting these arguments really since the early 70s. Do you feel there's a new urgency to them? I do. I think it's partly that we have the capacity now to do so much more than we could in the 1970s. We have the means, we have a better understanding of the situation, and we have become more affluent than we were in the 1970s. And the number of poor people in the world as a proportion of the world's population has shrunk. So the urgency really is to say, look, we, we can do something about it now. Whereas perhaps in the 70s, it, it all seemed too hard. And if we can do something about it, then it seems to follow that we ought to be doing something about it. So is it a sort of new philosophy for a time of plenty in a way? I think it's a, it's a new philosophy for an, for an age that has come to the point where really... It's a scandal that so much poverty and so much unnecessary death continues, uh, that the world has so much wealth, so much capacity, that it's really time to put this into the past. There are some who might say to you, what's a philosopher doing talking like this? This is a political statement. This is a, a political manifesto about the distribution of wealth. Uh, no, I think it's very much what philosophers talk about, and you can go right back to the beginning of the Western philosophical tradition to... Plato's Republic, um, and you find discussions of justice and, and what do we owe to others. Um, that's a central part of, of philosophy, of, of ethics. What do I owe to strangers? What do I owe to my family? What is it to live a good life? Um, those are questions which we face as individuals. 
I'm not just saying the government ought to do this or the collective is responsible for that. I'm really posing questions about what should I do in my life? How should I live? And that's a core philosophical concern. And yet we have this real self-interest ethic, don't we? Paul Keating had a great line, in any two-horse race, always back self-interest. At least you know it's trying. <laughs> and a lot of people might agree with him. Uh, we, there's quite a bit of research to show that we're a bit uh, uncomfortable with undeniable setting aside of self-interest. That's true, and I think it's one of the things that we ought to be trying to change. Uh, people are often uncomfortable with saying, I give money away or, you know, I do this because I want to help others. Uh, so they even try sometimes to disguise it and say, well, you know, this is good for business. I think we should try to be more open about that. I think we should challenge the norm of self-interest and we should say openly, I think it's important to be prepared to help others. Even if you don't know them. Even if you don't know them, even if they're strangers, that's right. So in other words, you're saying we have to con think about the comfort of strangers as much as those close to us. That's a, that's a really quite a profound recalibrating of an ethic, isn't it? Well, I'm not saying we have to be completely impartial between, say, our children and the children of strangers. But I do think that uh, we certainly have to bring the interests of strangers more to the centre of our attention, even if not on an equal footing with those of our own children or, or others who we love and who are close to us. Still, um, they shouldn't be pushed totally out of the picture, as they so often are now, by that focus on the immediate family and, and other, very, other people very close to us. What do I mean when I'm talking about poverty in the world? The World Bank defines extreme poverty in terms of not having enough to meet your basic needs. For many years, it said that people living on less than one US dollar per day were extremely poor. And you might have heard the figure that there are about a billion people in the world who live on less than one US dollar per day. Just recently, the World Bank upped that to $1.25 US, still less than two Australian dollars. So what does it mean to try and survive on less than that? For a start, it means that you can't really be sure that you will be able to put enough food on the table for yourself or your family. But in addition to that, you may not have safe drinking water available. So you may have to walk for two hours a day to fetch water. It's a life really where you can perhaps just struggle to cover your basic physical needs, but you don't have the opportunity to lead a life that has the sort of dignity uh, that we think of as a minimally decent life for human beings. What do you mean by basic needs? I'd like you to define it because your definition might be different to mine. Well, the, the, the real concept of basic needs, if you cut it right down, are simply the physical needs that are unavoidable for all of us. So to have enough calories to keep our bodies going, to have shelter from extreme elements, uh, to have uh, water that is safe to drink. So I think those are, that's the core of it. Now, I would go a little beyond that. I would say to have some minimal level of health care, um, should also be considered a basic need. Also, I would add some level of education for your children. I think uh, at least a primary school level of education should be considered a basic need. <laughs> UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Foundation, tells us that almost 10 million children die every year from preventable poverty-related causes. That's 27,000 children dying every day. We know how to reduce the number of deaths of children in developing countries, but we don't put enough resources into it 
to really do the job, to do it fast and effectively. And it's quite possible that for the cost of an expensive pair of shoes, we could save a child's life if we give it to one of those organisations. That's working effectively against poverty. Ask yourself, have you bought something to drink in the last week when you had safe water coming out of the tap for free? Perhaps you bought bottled water, perhaps you bought a juice, perhaps you bought a beer or a latte, whatever it might be. If you didn't spend on that and you put that money aside, at the end of the year, you might well have enough to give to one of those organisations that are helping people in poverty and perhaps to save a child's life. Perhaps you upgraded your television to a flat screen TV or perhaps you went on a holiday abroad or you bought some new clothes because the clothes that you wear, though they weren't worn out, were not the current fashions and you were tired of them. Again, that shows that you have more than you need, that you are affluent. And the question uh, that I'm asking is, if we have that ability to help those in poverty, shouldn't we be doing it? I like to think that most Australians are charitable people. We've always been ready to give generously in times of crisis. But we're also people who work hard. Haven't we earned the right to enjoy life? Maybe that does mean sometimes splurging on an overseas holiday, or a new dress, or a better TV. In setting up this new standard of giving, which is what you're talking about, do you want people to totally rethink luxury? I want people to rethink the role that luxury plays in their lives as compared with other goals that I want them to adopt. So I want them to say one of my important goals must be to share some of my comfort, some of my good fortune with those who are really poor. If I do that and I still feel that it's important for me to have some luxuries, some indulgences. Uh, I'm not going to condemn that. Uh, I think that once you've played your part, then, OK, uh, we have grown used to a, a level of comfort that is, that is hard to give up. But I would like people to, to rethink what is involved in living a good life and to rethink at least the minimum standard that they have to measure up to in order to feel OK about then spending something on luxuries. Do you ever feel that you're playing on people's guilt for being prosperous? I try to appeal to people's uh, compassion and, and sympathy for others rather than their guilt. I don't think guilt is really terribly productive. I mean, it, it may be for some people a, a good thing that, that gets them moving. But uh, I don't want people to be, you know, lying awake, tortured with guilt at night. I want them to actually write that check or go online and use that credit card and then I want them to feel good about it. That's much better, I think. I want them to feel good about it. I want them to talk to others about how they feel good about it and how their lives go better because of that. Because that's a more effective way to make it spread than to just try to get uh, guilt to spread. That's not going to do any good. But can you direct me back to a time in history when we didn't have any extreme mass poverty? No, I think probably we are for the first time in a situation where we have the resources to create a world without extreme mass poverty. After all, for most of our history, people had to struggle simply to find enough food and uh, shelter to survive. But uh, we've now got to the point where the average person in an affluent country uh, earns enough in just a few hours, not even a full working day, to feed themselves for a week if, if we're simply focusing on, on purchasing food. So uh, that gives us much more spare capacity and that's what I think makes it wrong 
not to focus on this. The fact that for the first time we have the opportunity to change the world and put this behind us. Isn't it true that it's trade and globalisation that has really reduced the numbers of people in poverty? I think it's true that trade has played a, a huge role in pulling hundreds of millions of people out of extreme poverty. Uh, we see that particularly in China and in India. But uh, there are some things that trade doesn't do. Trade doesn't seem to be very good at really reaching the people on the very bottom, that, that poorest 10% of the world's population. Trade hasn't really been so effective in some parts of Africa uh, where the proportion of people living in extreme poverty is highest but there really isn't the infrastructure for them to produce something and then transport it to a port where they can sell it to us. According to Peter Singer, if the globalisation of trade hasn't reached the extreme poor, the globalisation of climate change certainly has. I think climate change is, is a classic example of how the world has become one, how we're all interwoven, and how things that we might think are quite private and local, such as how much do we drive, what sort of car do we drive, even, you know, what do we eat, because uh, beef produces a lot of greenhouse gases. But those things that we think of as private and personal decisions are actually having an impact on people on the other side of the world. And so we can't deny now that we're all interconnected. We can't shirk responsibility for changing the lives of people we never see. What do you say to people who would reply to you, this is a government's job, it's not for me? If the government were doing that job adequately and effectively, I would be very happy. But in Australia, the government is giving only 32 cents in every $100 that the nation earns to overseas aid. And even that is not really going to the world's poorest people. So I would say, do you think that's enough? What I see at the moment is that the non-government agencies are the ones who are really doing the most effective work, the ones who are efficiently getting out there, directly helping the people who in need, working through local grassroots organisations. And we all have it within our capacity to help them to do a lot more. Australians throw away more than five billion dollars worth of food each year. We spend more than two billion dollars feeding our pets and half a billion on bottled water. According to Peter Singer, we need to change our ways. He thinks we should each pledge five percent of our incomes to overcome poverty. I wonder whether he's asking too much. And if I were to say to you that I love the idea of what you're describing, but I just don't think I could live up to it. I would say you can feel content with what you're doing if you know that you're making a significant effort. And that's why I talk about this 5% uh, level, say, if people on a reasonably comfortable sort of income, not mega rich, not just scraping by either, if, if they give 5% of their income uh, to relieve global poverty. I think that that's a, a good faith effort. That's something that you can say, well, I hope other people will do this and if we do, we'll have the resources to deal with the problem. And then you can relax, if you like, to some extent. You can get on with the rest of your life knowing that. So that's not so difficult. I think if people think of it that way, uh, it's not really the case that you say, I just can't live up to that. You can. It's a question of whether you take the decision to do it. Why do people find it so hard to give away their money? Like poorer people give more routinely than wealthier people. Doesn't make sense. It's strange. Um, perhaps, perhaps it's because 
people who acquire wealth have done so by habits of valuing money and uh, wanting to accumulate it, watching how much they have. Um, those who've never had a lot of it, maybe, uh, it comes and goes and it's easier for them to actually give it away. They're, they're less attached to it. But of course, there's a lot in our society that reinforces this idea that uh, you judge your success by how wealthy you are and, of course, by uh, the status symbols that you can afford, the kind of car you drive, the kind of house you live in, uh, the kind of clothes you wear. So uh, it really requires us to turn our back on this, at least to some extent, and to say, well, I'm going to judge myself more by what I do, by whether I live an ethical life, than by what I can afford. Peter Singer's invitation to consider the world's poor is not new. For members of the major religions, care of the poor and the needy is a serious obligation. In the Bible, there are no less than 3,000 references to alleviating poverty, making this a central moral issue for Christians. In Hebrew, the word for charity is sedaka, which means justice. So for Jews, giving to the poor is not an optional extra, but part of living a just life. Islam, too, requires Muslims to give a proportion of their wealth every year to those in need. Do you think that you're making the sort of argument that once would have been made by a religious preacher or a scholar from one of the great religions. In other words, are you filling a vacuum uh, that is thrown up by the decline of the organised religions? I do think that what I'm saying is very much in harmony with the teachings of some of the world's great religions, uh, whether that's Judaism, Christianity, Islam, uh, or Buddhism, or some uh, other teachings from uh, other religions. I certainly think that that's true. But I would say I'm not just filling a gap caused by the decline in religion. I'm filling a gap caused by the failure of some of the leaders of those religions to actually live up to the messages that they find in the texts they take as sacred. I mean, I don't see the Pope uh, living a life of poverty. Uh, I don't see him travelling in a modest way. It reminds me of the example of, of Gandhi, who when he went to, uh, to Delhi uh, as part of the taking over the independence of India, went to stay in a slum with some of the poorest workers. Um, when the Pope went to New York uh, a year or two back, he stayed in a $17 million uh, Upper East Side apartment. And you can just imagine the impression that would make if the Pope or some other leader of a major religion really took a vow to live modestly and, and uh, very simply not to spend anything on themselves while there were so many poor people in the world. Fortunately, Peter Singer doesn't expect us all to live so simply. But he does think it's realistic to expect that we contribute to solving the problem of world poverty. And he has some provocative ideas about who we should be giving to. And what if you're already giving? You're giving your 5%, but you're giving it to the Surf Life Saving Association and the Blind Associations and um, St Vincent de Paul or whatever, to Australian poor people, but not extreme poor. Should one be swapped for the other? Well, yes, I really do think that one should be swapped for the other in that case. Uh, I think that our dollars go further in relieving poverty if they go to people in developing countries rather than if they go to people in Australia. Because we're, we, we tend to be better off already in Australia. Because our most basic needs already get met in Australia, if we're contributing to the poor in Australia, we are doing something that's on top of meeting basic needs. Whereas when we give it to people in the poorest countries, we're actually just starting to meet those basic needs. There's still so many of the basic needs that are unmet. You like to be controversial, don't you? <laughs> because I, li I like to follow the reasoning where it goes, and I think this is where it goes here. So when Australians gave millions almost within the first week to the bushfire appeals. Uh, would you like them to have just thought again about that and whether there could have been money better spent elsewhere? Well, I think it's always great when you see people moved by compassion for others and 
that happened in the immediate aftermath of the bushfires. But what does worry me is that when something is not on the front page of the papers, when something is not on your TV screen at night, people forget about it. And they forget that though there were several thousand people who lost a lot in the fires, there are every day, according to UNICEF, 27,000 children who are dying from poverty-related causes, but they don't end up on our TV screens. It's those children Peter Singer believes we can save. He thinks we'll come to see that we should help the children of strangers, just as we'd go to the aid of a drowning child. Ultimately, you seem to be saying that this is an optimist's philosophy. Explain how it is, because in some ways it might seem to a lot of people listening in to be an invitation to guilt-free austerity, but nevertheless austerity. I'm not naively utopian. I mean, I think people who think that uh, someday people won't be selfish, they'll think impartially about the good of everyone, um, they'll be happy to live uh, in peace and equality with, with everyone, I think that is naive. But um, I do think we can still do better than we are now. I think at the moment we have that norm of self-interest, people really give very little, uh, and I certainly think we can make substantial progress beyond that. So those are the ways in which I would say my, my philosophy is an optimistic one. And you actually enjoy this philosophy. I mean, it's the question about personal joy and self-interest in this. So you, you sense that it has contributed to your enjoyment of life? Yes, perhaps that's, that's a, perhaps that's a third sense in which I'm optimistic, in that I, I do believe that there is some degree of harmony here between helping others and helping yourself, that um, our own lives become more fulfilling and more rewarding if we do work for larger purposes beyond ourselves, and working to relieve global poverty is clearly one of those larger purposes. So, so that's something that's encouraging too, because if more people come to see this, more people come to believe it, then more people will do what's good for others as well as what's good for themselves. Peter Singer, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Geraldine.